Man in the Dark from 1953 was an enjoyable crime film and one of the early films to use 3D effects. It stars Edmund O'Brien and Audrey Totter and involves the story of a criminal guy who opts to get experimental brain surgery in order to turn good again. But will it work? Well, let's check out this film and find out. The film opens up at a hospital where a couple of police officers are standing outside of a room. Now, inside is the character Steve Rawley, played by my hero Edmund O'Brien, who is a thug who is about to get some sort of advanced experimental brain surgery in order to turn from his life of crime and start over again. Now, he's antsy about it, and he's not fond of getting a sedative before the surgery, but when they bring in the big orderly, well, they get him under control, and soon he is sedated and off to surgery. Now, check out this creepy point-of-view surgery scene. This is one of the first 3D effects that we will see in the film. And I mean, even without the 3D glasses, still a little bit creepy. Dr. Marston, played by actor Dayton Loomis, is told the surgery is a success. And indeed, Steve seems to be slowly recovering. Now, a Mr. Jaywald shows up, played by actor Dan Riss, and... He wants to meet with the doctor, and he's basically this mysterious character who wants payment from Steve. But the doctor tells him that Steve will likely have no memory of who he is or money that he owes. Soon enough, Steve is up and about. He seems to be in good spirits, but his memory is apparently gone. They do a lie detector test on him with positive results. Now, one day, Steve is he's still recovering, and he's just kind of chilling out and doing some hedge work when he gets abruptly grabbed by some thugs and loaded into a car. And this leads to an exciting car chase scene with the police in pursuit. And notice that thug shooting out the window, but in 3D. They bring Steve to their hangout, where he's reunited with his lovely girlfriend, Peg, played by actress Audrey Totter, who gives him a kiss, but he has no idea who she is, or who any of them are, for that matter. Now, Lefty is the crime boss. He's played by actor Ted DeCorgia, who I've seen in other crime classics like The Killing and Crime Wave. He doesn't believe this whole amnesia thing, and he's ready to beat up Steve when the coincidental radio trope suddenly interrupts to bring news that the police are on the lookout for him. But the radio makes him sound like he's a criminal on the run, which Steve denies. Lefty is ready to burn Steve with a cigar in 3D when Peg pleads with him to just try to convince him of who he is. Don't make me dot the eyes. No, Lefty! So Peg takes Steve to another room to try to ply him with some sugar, but he's got no memory of her, and she just leaves in a huff. The thugs are all playing cards, just kind of keeping Steve under watch for now. And by the way, I like the actor Nick Dennis here as one of the thugs. He's very expressive and comical as the character Cookie. A lot of times I watch these old films and I enjoy them for the leads primarily. But often there's just the odd supporting character that catches my attention that's just fun to watch. And I thought Nick Dennis was great here. I'd like to see more of his films actually. Well, Steve tries to make a call but he's apprehended. By the way, I love in the old films where, you know, in order to make a call, not only did you have to resort to using a landline, but you needed people to get off the line in order to get through to the operator and, and so on. <laughs> uh, those were the days. Well, the bad guys, they catch him on the phone, they beat him up a little bit, but Cookie tries to refresh his memory and tells him of his heist that Steve had pulled in the past. And this leads us to a flashback sequence. I mean, it would not be a crime film without the flashback. And we see that there was this robbery, and it was followed by this great rooftop chase scene of, you know, he's on the run, the police are after him, he's caught. And in lockup, Lefty is there and goes to question him about the money. But at that point, Steve just won't tell. So he knows where the money is at that point. But now that he's got amnesia, does he even know where the money is? So we cut back to the present time, and the thugs bring Steve to his old home to see if that will maybe jog his memory. Now it's abandoned and it's up for sale, and they don't find anything other than a paper with a number on it. You know, it's just like an escape room. 
Well, meanwhile, Jaywald is in pursuit, and at a bar, he gets a tip of where Peg is, and soon enough, he's able to track down where the thugs are holding out with Steve. So Jaywald leaves, just to kind of wait it out. And soon he's visited by Dr. Marston, remember the surgeon from earlier, and he would like to know where Steve is as well. Jaywald's attitude is basically, you know, once we get him and once we get the money back, he's all yours. Well, Steve got a rough beating and Peg is taking care of him because he's kind of in a feverish state. And it's during this time that Steve has another flashback, this time taking place at what looks like a carnival. Now, in the dream, he's on the run from the authorities who are shooting at him and there's a freaky 50s era laughing animatronic. It's crazy stuff. It's like the type of thing I dream at night. Well, after his crazy dream sequence, he wakes up and Peg is there to take care of him. And he cries out that his brain is all in a scramble. But Peg is there to give him some sugar and soon he's on the mend. Now, Lefty's scheme is just to let Steve go so that they can follow him to where they think he's hidden the loot. You know, it's probably by that freaky laughing robot thing. That's my suspicion, but let's watch and see. They take a cab to the post office where he wonders if that number he found might refer to his old box. Now, Peg is getting concerned. She doesn't want to see Steve turn back to his old ways and tells him just to throw away the past. But the post office box we find out wasn't his, so he decides to head to Ocean Park Pier to try to jog his memory. And I love seeing this old carnival footage, by the way. You know, the music, the sights and sound. They try to check for the package that he may have left. And I got a chuckle from the bickering old couple running the place. Look, I tried to... No, I ain't gonna let this woman get my blood pressure up. I just ain't gonna allow it. Huh. Sure enough, Steve finally gets his money in this little shoebox, and maybe we're starting to see his transformation back into the greedy crook earlier version of himself. Peg seems concerned about him. He says, we can argue about this in Europe someday. And she finally says, send me a postcard and walks off. Uh, I love that crime film dialogue. While she walks away, the thugs are after Steve again, and he's on the run. Can he escape them? Will he be able to sneak off, maybe by a roller coaster? Will that creepy laughing robot continue to freak us all out? Well, you need to watch this film for yourself to find out. The ending was great. So just some quick closing thoughts. This was a fun crime film produced by Columbia Pictures and directed by Lou Landers, who has directed a ton of films and television shows. I reviewed his film Inner Sanctum a while ago. And this film was a remake of a 1936 crime film, The Man Who Lived Twice. So I need to add that to my list. The big gimmick of the film was that this was one of the early films to feature 3D effects. And I do have to admit, some of the 3D effects were done in such a... <laughs> blatant, cheesy sort of way. It kind of reminded me of the old comedy show SCTV and how they'd have things like Count Floyd's 3D House of Beef. <laughs> Would you like to see a menu? <laughs> In any case, this came out about the same time as the movie The House of Wax, another old classic I've reviewed on this channel. Edmund O'Brien, as my three fans know, was one of my favorite actors, and he's great here as the criminal character with the identity amnesia. And I know it's kind of a silly device to use in a film, but it's all good, and he's forgotten that he was a criminal while still maintaining the tough guy edge. And you know, he sure runs a lot in his films. DOA or 7-Eleven Ocean Drive, he always seems to be on the run, being chased around somewhere. Audrey Totter was great as the bad girl, who still has the thing for O'Brien's character and really softens for the guy and feels sorry for his plight. And I like how she's wary of his slowly slipping back into his old criminal ways as we near the end of the film. She's not having any of that. There was some nice location footage filmed at Ocean Park Pier, today Pacific Ocean Park in Santa Monica. I guess Ocean Park Pier was around from 1926 to 1956 and then it changed to Pacific Ocean Park and they changed a bunch of the rides and it was neat to me to see some of the old roller coaster footage and oh that laughing animatronic that I keep bringing up this was called a laughing sal and it used to be something to entertain or terrify people from the 1950s and 
it was just kind of a fun detail of this film because it did sort of add to the the creepiness of his flashbacks. Just an interesting tidbit from history to see. And you know, kudos to the stunt doubles who did the exciting climbing around on building tops and climbing around the roller coaster. I mean, I'm pretty sure that wasn't Edmund O'Brien up there on the top of the roller coaster making his escape. And these stunts were pretty impressive. So watch the film for that as well. The ending sequence was really impressive. I thought it was a fun chase scene. No spoilers. You can watch for yourself to see how things end. In any case, that's Man in the Dark from 1953. It was an enjoyable crime noir film. It's worth checking out.